الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد So yesterday we discussed how the Quran was preserved through what? Memorization And you mentioned 35 names from the Sahaba رضي عنهم that سندن with the asanid, historic documentation that can be verified, were known to be Hufad of the Qur'an. As I mentioned, there are others who also memorized the Qur'an. Some of the ulema said up to a thousand of the Sahaba, but we discuss those that you can actually find in the books of Hadith, Sanadan. There are others that may be known to be Hufad through other ways as well. The second method of the preservation of the Qur'an. Tell you, why is this important to us? Why is it important to us how the Qur'an was preserved? Because the kalam of Allah. And today we base all our aqidah, our belief on the Qur'an. Let's take the Bible for example. Tayyib. In the Bible today, that if you get a Bible, there is the Old Testament. According to the scholars of the Judaic faith, yani the Old Testament, which we originally, it was the Torah. They say the original Torah is all gone. It was all lost with Babylon and things. And then, you know, parts of those stories and things were recollected. So they don't have their original scripture. Tell you, it was corrupted. If we look at the New Testament, what is the New Testament? It is based on what we call the Injil, which was revealed to Isa alayhi salam. But what was revealed to Isa alayhi salam today we don't have. It has been corrupted. How do we know that? Tell you. The four books that are well known today in the New Testament. There are other chapters, but four. What are they? Matthew, Luke, Mark, John. These four. Who are these four? Huh? Some people say these are apostles. But even if you look at research by Christians, go to Google and look up the books, these four were written sev- about 70 years after the time of Isa alayhi salam, when we believe Isa alayhi salam was taken back to Allah, and the Christians they say he was killed, right? But even they say that after the, according to them, crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam, they said then about 70 years later these people wrote these books. And we don't know exactly who they are. If you look at research on them, most of the authorship is anonymous, right? And then Paul is even after that and his writings. He never met Isa alayhi salam. Paul never met Isa alayhi salam. He says I saw a vision. I don't know. You know, sometimes people see things. Yeah? You know, you see some bums nowadays downtown. They think they met Isa alayhi salam too, but Allahu alam. But Paul, he he was seventy to hundred years around that time after Isa alayhi salam. So what they wrote was not there in the time of Isa alayhi salam. And the Injil that was revealed to Isa alayhi salam, some parts of it maybe in the in the writings today, but that in essence was lost. And even Christians will tell you. Right? And that's why, inshallah, tomorrow, I hope that we will have a dars continuing about the Quran, but this time we're going to go over the Bible and the contradictions in the Bible and the mistakes in the Bible. So when you are giving da'wah to somebody, you can show those and we'll mark out each verse so you can use that in your da'wah. Tell you? But before we go to the Bible, we want to know the Quran. So the first way of memorization was when Sahaba memorized it. Second was it was written down. When was the Quran written down? So there are three stages of the writing of the Quran. As Imam Sayyuti mentioned at Qan, and other ulama like Zahabi and others have mentioned as well. Al awwal fa fi hayat al Nabi alayhi salatu salam. The first, during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Some people say the Quran was not written until the time of Abu Bakr or Uthman. It's a mistake. And we have historic evidence for that. We don't just say it's a mistake. What is the evidence? The evidence is the hadith reported by Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. فقال كنا عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعلف القرآن من رقاعة. طيب. So the Sahaba, during the lifetime of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, they memorized the Quran. But they also wrote down the Qur'an. They wrote down the Qur'an on many things, including 
يعني paper that was made out of leather, يعني leather sheets, including on bones, including on rocks, whatever they could write. And the Arab were not in the tradition of writing books at that time. We don't know of a complete book that the Arab had before this. A complete book. They had writings of shu'ara and poets and stuff, but a complete book. So they would write down and the best thing they would do is memorize. So there is the memorization because they would memorize. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that time and those people with a great hikmah. Today, if we came here, how many of us memorized our textbooks in school? Maybe Jibreel, mashallah, is, studies a lot. Huh? But most of us didn't. Right? We don't memorize. We write it down, we take notes. The Arab, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they were memorizers. They would have shu'ara. People who were poets, and that was something a big deal for them. And the poet, he would memorize everything that he had learned, and then he would recite everything in poetry. So even when he was upset with his children, he would he would curse them in poetry. When he was fighting with his wife, he would fight in poetry. When he would go out and buy and sell things, he would do it in poetry. And then he would have a rabi. A rabi would be somebody as a child given to him to serve him, who would memorize everything the poet said. 30,000, 40,000 abiyat, he would memorize it. Everything the poet said, he would memorize it. So the Arab were good at memory at the time. But they also had a system of writing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that time because those two strengths were there. So the first for memorizing, so it was very easy to have so many huffaz amongst the sahaba and so many memorizers of hadith that could memorize thousands of hadith. Why? Because they were at the time in a habit of memorizing. But not just the oral tradition, the Qur'an was written down in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Al-Bayhaqi mentions this also with the authentic rawaya. Then during the khilafah, so this is the first was, the first writing down was when? During the life. The entire Qur'an was written down. What is the proof for that? We'll get to it. Then during the khilafah, of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyanhu. They had the battles of Ridda, the battles against the Murtaddin, against Musaylim al kadhab and them, who were the apostates, right? In one of the battles, many of the Qurra, they became shuhada, they became martyrs. They didn't just sit around reading Quran, they were out, mashallah, fi sabilillah. So they became shuhada. So as this hadith reported in Bukhari and Muslim, in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, Sanadan, authenticated. Then Umar Radiyan, he came to Abu Bakr. Now Abu Bakr Radiyan's Khilafah is right after the death of Rasulullah This is not years and years later. Abu Bakr Radiyan's Khilafah is only two and a half years around. So right after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi during these early battles, Umar Radiyan, he saw the need for the Qur'an to be written down. Because if it's only memorized, it could be that somebody would make a mistake. So now, a point of faida. During the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi there were 70 qurra that were made shaheed in the trick done by one of the tribes. And most of them, we don't know their names. So what does that mean? That we had so many other huffal, not just the 35 we mentioned. 70 that became shuhada. So that was so many 70 other huffal. And that means very likely that as ulema have written, there was around a thousand that had memorized. Now this is the second time where a large number of qurra during that first couple of years after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi from the Sahaba and Tabi'un became shuhada. So I told you there were many qurra at the time. So Umar radiyan seeing the need, they came to Abu Bakr radiyanhu, and he told him to compile the Qur'an as a book, and in one place. It was already written down. So here Abu Bakr radiyan, after some convincing, because they were very afraid to do anything that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi didn't do, but they saw a benefit in it, and they saw a hadith that allowed it, and these were khulafa. And they had the right to make ishtihad. So they compiled the Qur'an. Abu Bakr radiyan, he went to Zayd ibn Thabit radiyan. And Zayd ibn Thabit was one of the people who was a hafiz himself. And he was one of the ones who used to write wahi. So he was given the task to compile the Qur'an as a book in the first Khalifa's time. Right? A year, around a year after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So here Zayd ibn Thabit, the interesting thing that he says, that when this task was given to me, at first he refused. He said, I can't do something that Rasul Sallam didn't do. When Abu Bakr then explained to him that this is something beneficial, that there is asal in the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and everything is you know, according to the sunnah, he took on the task, he said, if Abu Bakr had asked me to move a mountain, it would have been easier for me than the task that I was given. Right? He said, we went and collected and we told everybody they have to bring a written ayah, every ayah written down during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu with a shahid, with a witness. Subhanallah. So that means the Quran that was compiled during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr radiyanhu was compiled from written sources during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and on top of that it was confirmed by the memorization of the Sahaba and every ayah had to have been reported by multiple narrators okay? one person could not just come and say there was an ayah you had to bring another person who had written down these ayat okay? so from the written works that were on rocks that were on pieces of leather, that were on paper, on whatever they could find, that was written down, they collected them together, and they made one book, and they had every ayah confirmed with a second source, and from the ones who had memorized themselves, and the greatest of them were the seven that we had mentioned, including Uthman radiyanu, and Zayd ibn Thabit, and Ali radiyanu, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and others that we had mentioned before, and others, for example, Abu Hura and Ibn Abbas and others, and, and uh, Umar and Abu Bakr, who were all Huffad, Ijma'an, with the consensus of the Muslim Ummah, they compiled this Quran. This Quran was with Abu Bakr radiyanhu. Right? After the death of Abu Bakr radiyanhu, it was given to Umar radiyanhu. Umar radiyanhu, he had it. And then Hafsa radiyanha. And then during the Khilafah of Uthman radiyanhu, when they saw that this Qur'an, that was one copy, would not be enough for the Ummah. The Ummah was spreading. And people would start to have disagreements in recitation. Why would they have disagreements? So the Qur'an was revealed on seven styles of recitation. What is meant by Ahruf al-Sab'a? We're going to have a dar separate on this. But because of difference in recitations, there started to be khilaf, not on the Qur'an, but on different ways of reciting. But Uthman radiyanu with his farasa, he saw that a time could come that the Muslims will start fighting with each other and they may start to differentiate. So he called on the same Sahabi. This is now the third. What was the first? Writing down of the Qur'an during the lifetime of the Prophet Second, Umar ibn, uh, Abu Bakr radiyanu. Third, Uthman ibn Affan. During the Khilaf, Uthman ibn Affan radiyanhu, he called Zayd ibn Thabit, he brought the Qur'an that was there with Hafsa radiyallahu anha, the same Qur'an that was compiled by Abu Bakr radiyanhu, and from it, and with the same collection of Sahaba, and the consensus, the ijma' of the Sahaba, on every ayah, he made the Qur'an in the tartib, in the way that we have today. Tayyib? The Qur'an... Every Mus'haf today has to be in alignment with the Mus'haf of Uthman radiyanhu. Every Qur'at, every recitation has to be in accordance to the Mus'haf of Uthman radiyanhu. And Uthman radiyanhu did not make one copy, but he made multiple copies. Five of them are documented in the books of Tariq Sanadan, that there were five. There may have been more or less as well, but those five are documented. And they were sent out to the different parts of the Muslim world. And they were written without tashkil, yani without harakat. No fatha, no dhamma, no kasara. Why? The Arab were not in need of it. They knew how to recite the Quran without dots. The fa and qaf would look the same. But they knew the words. For example, today, you guys all speak English, right? Anybody not speak English here? <laughs> right? You speak English. Ishaq, you don't speak English? Inshallah. We'll get you ESL class. If you speak English, today when I write pale, right, P-A-L-E, you will know it's pale, right? You will not say pale, 
right? Although, I mean, if you put accents, you could write pale. But you know it's pale, right? Because you know the word. So you don't, if you don't know how to pronounce it, if you go on a, in a dictionary, they actually have accents. How to pronounce it in English. They have like lines and little dots and things, right? But none of us need that. None of us read a book with that. Why? Because we know the language well enough that when we see night with a K, we don't say kanait. Any of you say kanait? Huh? Not doing good in school? It's hawk, you, you good? All right. And you say kanaif? Have you ever said kanaif? No. Why, why don't you pronounce a K? Because you know, right? Like that, the Arab, they wouldn't mistake between a fa and a qaf because they knew. They wouldn't mistake between a jim and a ha because they knew the words. They didn't need accents and fatha and damma and, and kasra and these things, right? And this was how familiar they were with their language. Today, if you take an Arab who speaks Arabic fluently and you give them a Quran without any dots, without any harakat, without anything like this, they won't be able to read it because the language has become weak even with the Arab. But at that time, it was strong. So Uthman Radian, he made those musahif in such a way that they would allow different types of recitation. They would allow different forms of recitation. And that's why all of the Qur'an that we have today, all of the styles of recitation are in line with the Mus'haf of Uthman Radian. And that's why there were some differences given for, for the ability for different recitations to be recited. And there were no elongations. You know, when, when you add a alif for a mad, those were not put in the Mus'haf of Uthman Radianu. For example, Malik Yomiddin, today in the Mus'haf, will have Meem, Alif, Lam, Kaf. If you're reading a Mus'haf on uh, Hafs and Asim, it will have Meem, Alif, Lam, Kaf. But if you're reading the Mus'haf on Qalun or Warsh, it will have Meem, Lam, Kaf, Malik. Because the Alif here is elongation. So the Mus'haf of Mandarin will not have that Alif. Because this is for Qur'at. Okay? So all the Qur'at, they go with the Mus'haf of Uthman Radianhu. Uthman Radian wrote it in such a way that it would be able to recite other recitations. If it was not, then it was given tarjih towards the recitation of Quraysh. Because that is the original harf that was revealed in. Okay? During the Khilafah of Uthman Radian, these Mus'haf were sent out. Those Mus'haf, some of them are with us today. Those musahif are in this ummah today. There are at least two that the ulama document, one in Uzbekistan, one in Turkey. Wallahu alam, but this is the, what we have read from them. And you will see they're very big and they're writing and pictures and, and things are, are online scans of them and you can recite from them. And in a, in a accreditation of what we are saying, there is... Uh, a page or a few pages of Surah Taha that were discovered in the West. So people in the West, they found this. And they decided, it's in Birmingham, I believe. Right? Bradford or Birmingham? Somewhere in England. And what they did is they carbon dated the paper. They did. Westerners, not Muslims. They did carbon dating of the paper. And carbon dating gives you a range. And that range, the middle of it, puts it towards the end of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we know Taha was one of the earlier surahs. Why do we know that? Because Bab al-Nuzul, when Umar radiyan walked in on his sister and his, and his uh, brother-in-law, Sa'id ibn Zayd, learning the Qur'an from Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiyallahu anhum, what surah were they learning? Taha. And they had it written. You know, Allah Allah, maybe it's the same writing. But the kuffar, they carbon dated this to the later part of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the range, Tayyip. and Alhamdulillah you can find it online, and you get it, and you get it, and you compare it to Surah Taha in the Mus'haf, you recite it exactly the same, exactly the same, not a, not a bit of a change. So what does that tell you? That tells you the writing of the Quran from the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that today even kuffar have carbon dated, shows the Qur'an was written and preserved and unchanged from that time. From the musahif of Uthman radiyanhu, that we have the entire mushaf, we have, we check, the Qur'an is exactly as it was. 
So during these three stages, the Quran was written down. Now Uthman radiyanhu, when he standardized the Quran, if anybody like Ibn Mas'ud and others had their own writing the Quran, he had them burnt. Why? It's very important. Because their writing may not be complete. They may have written a part of the Quran. And now people will say, this is the Mus'haf of this, and this is only, only these many surahs, and these are those many surahs. No. He standardized with the consensus of the Sahaba on one Mus'haf, made copies of it, allowed different recitations of it, and sent them out. Tayyib, then we hear from people that Hajjaj ibn Yusuf is the one who put the harakat. But this is not true. The fact is that during the Khilaf of Ali radiyanhu, Abu Aswad al-Duhili, and others, they realized that the Qur'an was not recited properly by the Ajam, and even the Arab were getting influenced by it. So they started the effort of putting dots just to show takhfim and tarqiq in the Qur'an. During the time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, the, during whose time, Hajjaj was a Amir, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Some of the ulema, they went to the Khalifa and they told him that we need more yani, harakat to know how to recite because many ajam are becoming Muslim, non-Arabs, and even the Arabs are not able to recite with just those dots. So in that time, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was made in charge of the project. But he didn't do it himself. He called the people of Ilm, he gathered a committee, and he had them write the harakat on the mushaf close to what we are seeing today, but not exactly. Right? As the time developed, the ulema, they developed adding the fatha and kasra and damma for us who are not well learned in the Arabic language to be able to pronounce it correctly. But every one of those musahif, whether it's on, the, on Qalun or Warsh or, or uh, Hafs and Asim or Shu'bah, they all have to have three conditions for them to be accepted. What are they? The first, they have to be in line with the Mus'haf of Uthman radiyanhu. We only have one Qur'an. And that is, may Allah reward Uthman ibn Affan radiyanhu for what khidmah he did for this ummah. Every one of you that reads the Mus'haf, whether you're in Tehran or anywhere else, make dua for Uthman radiyanhu. He is the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to preserve that Mus'haf in your hand. Tayyib. Second, it has to be what? in line with Arabic grammar. Because the Qur'an is the essence of Arabic grammar. This is where you end debates in Nahu, Where you end debates in what can be used and not. If somebody brings a recitation that doesn't fit what we know from the Qawaid al al Arabiya, it cannot be accepted because the Qur'an cannot have a mistake. Unlike the Bible, we see all these contradictions and mistakes in numbers. You will never find something like that in the Qur'an. We challenge those People who come and debate with us, we challenge them. You can watch our videos, we challenge them. Find one, the man, the Christian preacher that came here to debate. You can see the video. He said there's inaccuracy in the Quran. We challenge him to find one. Wallah, he couldn't find one. Watch the video. He couldn't find one. Third, what is the third shart? That it has to be, the recitation has to be reported mutawatiran an nabi alayhi salatu So the mushaf, it's already written. But you can pronounce it different ways, right? For example, uh, in English, for example, uh, let's take a word like bread. How do you say bread? bread. You said bread. But in England, they'll say bread. They'll, they'll, they'll shorten it, right? For example, you say tomato. How do you say tomato? In England, they say tomato. They write it the same. You say potato. In England, they say potato. They write it the same. So there are different ways to pronounce it. So the Qur'an, the written, is only what is with the Mus'haf Uthman radiyanhu. But now in the recitation of it, what we call Qur'at, even the recitation, you cannot recite any way you like. You cannot say, Gul hu Allahu ahad. <laughs> Somebody says our accent, we say, Gul. Gul hu Allahu ahad. Nah. You can't, you, your, your accents today do not matter. You cannot come and say, yani, uh, uh, <laughs> we hear some people read this way. I was in behind an imam in Salah, he made these mistakes, right? But you cannot. Because even the recitation has to be 
from what Rasulullah sallallahu recited and what was reported through multiple authentic chains. Not one chain leading back to Rasulullah but mutawatir. And they have to be suhih. All the tarawis are checked. So authentic and multiple chains even for the recitations. Even for the recitations. If there is a method of recitation where it is through one chain, these are shad, these are put away. We only use those mutawatiran. So every qira'a has to fit these three shurut. So inshallah, this is going to be the end of the dars today. So we know how the Qur'an was written down and how it was preserved. Inshallah, tomorrow in this series, we will have a dars on the Bible and, and how it was corrupted and the proof from the Bible itself. I'll bring my, the, my own personal Bible and I'll show you the verses that contradict so you can take notes and learn and memorize and use in your